With regards to motor control, there is a crossing over that happens with signals. It turns out the right side of the brain controls movements on the left side of the body, and the left side of the brain controls movements on the right side of the body. So at some point on the descending tract, um, the signals cross over. We'll see that a little bit later on in this chapter. The same is true for um, for sensations, for sensory information, sensory information that's coming from the body up to the brain, it also undergoes a crossing over. That's called a decussation if cr uh, fibers cross over. And um, that doesn't mean that the two sides of the brain function completely independently. They do communicate with each other as well. And the way that they communicate with each other is through, essentially it's a bridge from the right to the left halves of the cerebral hemispheres. That bridge, if we take a look at this picture, that bridge is called the corpus callosum. It's this white um, section right here. And it's shown in cut form right here. This has been, it has been severed. This is now called a split brain. This person would still be okay. Um, in fact, this is actually a treatment that is performed in some really severe cases of epilepsy. Sometimes in cases of epilepsy, the communication between um, the two sides of the brain is not quite what it should be. The signals sort of get mixed up and cause more communicate more confusion than communication. And so sometimes severing that corpus callosum is actually an effective treatment for epilepsy. But supposing that we're talking about uh, more of a, a neurotypical brain where that communication is beneficial between right and left halves, um, this coordination really helps really helps us to, to be able to do things effectively. Um, and studies of the, the right versus the left half of the brain, studies have indicated that there is some specialization between the two halves, um, but it's not like only the right can do this task and only the left can do, di can do this other task. There's a lot of sharing of tasks between the two. So let's take a look at some of the sort of key things that have been mapped to these different halves, these different hemispheres of the brain. The right hemisphere, of the brain over here. This seems to really be specialized for tasks that involve both vision and a spatial awareness. Um, so for example, being able to arrange blocks, being able to stack blocks, build things with blocks, um, being able to read maps even. So having that awareness, being able to see something on a map and relate it to, to the three-dimensional spaces around you, um, that really seems to be tied to the right brain, the right hemisphere recognizing faces as well. And that, that kind of makes sense. A face has a lot of three-dimensional shape to it. And to be able to recognize that as really characteristic of a person, that's something that the right brain is heavily involved with. The left hemisphere, on the other hand, this is really where a lot of our language abilities come from, being able to um, comprehend language as well as being able to speak language is um, tied to the left brain. A lot of calculations, analytical abilities seem to be focused on the left brain. And again, this is not to say that the right brain can't do it. It's just, it's not quite as specialized. Maybe it's not quite as efficient at doing it. So right brain and left brain, ordinarily they do communicate with each other through that corpus callosum. We just said that the left hemisphere of the brain is specialized for a few specific tasks, including language. We're going to go ahead and focus in on that language ability of the brain for just a minute. And most of what we know and understand about language in the brain uh, comes from studying individuals who have problems, different sorts of troubles uh, with language. Those are called aphasias. And in those cases, what we can do is do different imaging techniques on the brain and just see which regions are behaving differently um, than in other people. So what we have learned from studying individuals with aphasias is that there are a few key areas in the brain that seem to contribute to language. We're going to start with Broca's area. Broca's area is on the frontal lobe of the brain. It's over here on the side, sort of lower edge of the frontal lobe. And this is where a lot of the motor abilities um, that are required for speech are controlled from. So being able to speak, being able to form words, 
um, seems to be initiated in Broca's area right here shown in orange. If there is an aphasia involving Broca's area, then what happens is that person, they can still speak, but it takes a, it usually takes a lot longer. It takes them a while to get their words together, and then the articulation might not be very um, precise when they do speak. So um, in, this, in this type of aphasia, there's no problem with understanding. The person with the aphasia can understand language no problem. It's just the formation of speech that seems to be affected. And the other interesting note here is for aphasias involving Broca's area, um, interestingly there's no problem with, with other aspects of movement that involve um, the mouth. So for example the person would still be able to eat and drink with no problems. It's just speech formation is the thing that is affected. So that's Broca's area. Another area that's involved with language is over here in the back. This is called Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area, this exists at the at the very top back of the temporal lobe of the brain, right? Temporal lobe was on the side. Um, so Wernicke, Wernicke's area right here, aphasias involving Wernicke's area, these tend to be more serious. In this case, there is a loss of comprehension. A person would not be able to um, understand words that are even spoken to them anymore. And Wernicke's area seems to be involved, tied very heavily with the hearing aspect um, of language. So Wernicke's aphasias, uh, again, this is, uh, in my opinion anyway, this seems like a more serious problem because the comprehension ability is gone. When people with Wernicke's aphasias um, speak, when they try to speak, uh, their words tend to just come out kind of as a jumble. It's actually referred to as word salad, and there's no meaning behind it as far as we can tell. It's just sort of a random string of words, doesn't have r real meaning behind it. Another very important that's right important area that's right next door is called the angular gyrus. The angular gyrus is interesting because it exists at the junction of three different lobes of the brain. So it's sitting right at the junction between the parietal lobe, um, right, or, or appears the parietal lobe, parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and also the temporal lobe. So it's at the junction of all three of those. And as such, it's really key for integrating a lot of information. This helps us to integrate information from um, hearing and also information from vision, from our sense of vision. And if that integration doesn't happen properly, if there's, if there's damage to this area, um, there can be some very unusual sorts of aphasias that result. So just to give some examples, it's possible if a person has damage to their angular gyrus, it's possible that that person would still be able to speak no problem and still be able to understand um, spoken language with no problem, but they might not be able to read or write because okay? that's affecting two, two different forms of sensory input involved there. Another type of um, aphasia that can result from damage to the angular gyrus is a person might be able to write a sentence. They can physically write a sentence and it'll have meaning, but then they're not able to read it back. So they have the motor control, they're able to form the language, put the words down on the page, um, but then the, the reading ability, the vision side of things, doesn't get integrated back correctly. So very um, interesting coordination center right there with the angular gyrus.